Welcome to the CyberSec My Grant Podcast. I'm Femi, your host and guide in the dynamic world of cybersecurity. Here we dive into insightful interviews, stories, and discussions with industry experts, professionals, and thought leaders. Whether you're just stepping into cybersecurity realm or you're a seasoned veteran, our goal is to empower you with the knowledge you need to thrive. From industry trends to career guidance, success stories, and actionable tips, we cover it all. Before we jump into today's episode, a quick request. If you find the content valuable and think others would too, don't keep it to yourself. Share the CyberSec Migrant Podcast and our YouTube channel with your friends, colleagues, and fellow enthusiasts. Your recommendations would help us grow and create a community that fosters learning and collaboration. And now, let's get into the heart of our security insights. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to this episode of the CyberSec Migrant. So hello and welcome to another episode on the CyberSec Migrant, uh, the podcast where we talk about all things immigrants and the stories of successful immigrants who have come to Canada and have been successful at building a new life for themselves, sometimes starting a completely new career. And so this episode, we've got Kelly with us, Kelly B, and I like to call him. He is one of the people I really admire a lot. You can follow him on LinkedIn. He does a lot of great stuff on LinkedIn. Um, he is a dedicated career coach. Uh, he's also a mentor with passion for guiding individuals toward their professional aspirations. You know, he has helped numerous clients, both new grads, career transitioners, new immigrants, and seasoned professionals to achieve their career goals and maximize their professional. Uh, he is an experienced professional with over seven years of multifaceted engineering and project management experience across different sectors, including manufacturing, industrial automation, green energy technologies, and also IT. He has a an expertise, and people will like this, in robotics and automation systems. So, you know, people are going to put us out of work tomorrow, you know, also software development <laughs> and digital transformation initiatives as well. And he currently works as a project manager with Cummings. Um, he excels in empowering individuals to make informed career decisions, enhance their skills, and navigate the job market effectively. So you see, he's, he's not just an ordinary guy, but it's a guy who you can look to and say, this is an immigrant who has been successful. And some of his successes, I'm going to just reel out some of them here. So he's got a professional engineer license to work, operate as an engineer here in Canada, which everybody knows that's hard to get. So kudos. <laughs> he's also got multiple certifications in product and project management. And he got his Canadian citizenship this year. So he's, you know, he's a yeah, full-blown yeah. Canadian, you know, living the Canadian dream, no more the American dream, it's Canada now. Um, and despite yeah. all the doom and gloom and, oh, it's so hard to find housing, he bought his first investment property in 2022, which means he had his other property before that, you know, and he has coached and mentored multiple people into over 100,000 in annually in salaries, roles that pay over 100000 so six-figure roles. Um, so yeah. I've got a top guest who is living the dream, who can actually show us, you know, tell us his story of how he's got there. So Kelly, welcome to the CyberSec Migrant. Well, thanks, Femi. I was just listening to you go. I'm like, wait, is that me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the entire description, I'm like, is that me? Uh, but um, yeah, I, I think there's, uh, and they're all truthful, but I, I think sometimes, we just need someone to actually say, okay, this is who you are, at least from the outside, this is, you know, what you've achieved. And sometimes I think it's just uh, just a check again to say, okay, you know what? I'm actually not doing too bad, right? I yeah, agree. I yeah. agree. I think that's the thing. I was talking to someone, this was last week, talking about imposter syndrome where sometimes you, despite the fact that you've done really well, you know, by any standards, you know, by whatever yardstick you want to use, sometimes people will like, am I sure that's me or can I do that? And I don't know why it's very common with us immigrants. I don't know why, you know, sometimes you find people think that they aren't, you know, as successful as they are, or they haven't achieved as much as they think they should have. And I'm like, give yourself, a, give yourself a break, pat yourself on the back if you've done well, because, you know, you've done well, you know, and like I said, anybody listening to your profile, anybody listening to your bio can see that you've done well. I, I'm following you on LinkedIn. I'm looking forward to all the post for next year because I, I saw what you said yesterday on LinkedIn that um next year is to next year is the year to start empowering people and pulling people up. Either they like it yes, or not. Yes. <laughs> so but before right. we go that far, let's let's dial it back a bit. You know, tell us about how you moved from Nigeria to Canada. You know, what motivated you to make this move and why 
product and project management. Before you go on, people don't know. He has two bachelor's degrees, one in Nigeria and one here. And you're like, what? <laughs> well, um, so 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 let me correct that actually. So yes, um, I think so in Nigeria, I was actually studying mechanical engineering. So okay. so this is just my, my, my story now. I'm just I'm just gonna walk into it. So yes, I was actually studying mechanical engineering in Nigeria. I was actually in my second year in Nigeria when the opportunity came to actually move to Canada. Oh, okay. So it was one of those things where it's like, okay, do you, do you want to finish and then move to Canada and maybe do a master's or something? I think for me, I've always been this key where, yeah, Nigeria is my home country, but there's a lot of problems there. And uh, sure. I know for those people that try to solve it, sometimes it's a bit challenging. So I think at that time I decided for me, it was best to, to, to sort of step out of that environment. So I left with the, with the knowledge that I'm going to come to Canada and start all over again. So yeah, I left my second year there and I couldn't transfer, okay. obviously. I couldn't transfer everything. It's always so I hard. Came here <laughs> and um, I had to start all over. Yes. So I had to start Most all times. over again. So yeah, so Halfway I, I, I came world. and then I, pretty much, yeah, pretty much. So I think for me, it was very quick, actually, because initially my parents were, they've always been these people where it's like, oh, we're skeptical about, about sending our young kids overseas. And yeah. we've seen a lot of our friends send, the, you know, they send their kids to, to, to the US, to Canada, and some of them just go AWOL. And I think there was a bit of that fear. But um, I think I always give thanks to God, but also to Asu. There was a time when it was a big strike where <laughs> I was sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> yes. So I think my parent, my dad's son is like, nah, you know, my son can just sit here and just, you know, nothing, we're making, you know. you know, my parents did okay for themselves. And so they're like, you know, we just go, let's try. And uh, we tried and put you in God's hands. The visa came out, yes, and um, visa came out, and I would say from picking up my passport, stopped at the market, bought some clothes. By the time I got home, my my uh, flight ticket was already bought. That night, I left, and that was it. That was quick. And, um, <laughs> sharp, sharp. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> no looking back, uh, because for me as well, I think school already started. I think school was already in session one week in, and because my program was one of those programs, they start before any other program. So when most okay. programs were starting in September, mine was starting in, I think, mid to end of uh, August. So okay. it was weird. So I had to come immediately. So, you know, when I was leaving at the airport, send, send, you know, I was texting my guys like, you know, I'm leaving. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're just pulling one on us. I'm like, no, took a picture. I'm like, I'm actually out of here. That's it. <laughs> at the airport too. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was at Motala Mohamed Airport and that was it. And I left and I think I went back for the first time. Uh, in 21. That was the first time I went okay. back. During um, COVID? I left Ooh, when I was brave. Like 18. I, yes. Yes. See, I tell people sometimes in the midst of challenges, it's the best time to actually do your best work, honestly. Um, True. When I, agree. I live alone, at least then, and when COVID happened, when people were sort of locked up, guess what? I, tra I took a couple of my friends who traveled to Quebec City. And that was like epicenter of COVID, COVID. Like, you know, it was just like COVID, yeah, in COVID. Canada, yes. And we went, yeah. it was... Yes, it was almost 20 of us. It was supposed to be five people. It almost it turned to about 20 people. Had like Airbnbs all over the place. And we still traveled, even in the height of COVID. I was traveling to Vancouver. I was traveling traveling in the height of COVID. So I'm, I'm still here. So um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that's just how I got here. I left when I was 18, 19. And so far, I would say right now, Canada is my, my home. You know, I went through school here. I started my career here. And yeah. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, or like you said, I, I bought my first property here as well. And I have, actually, I have my, my two brothers living here in Canada now. And um, in October, my parents got tired of Nigeria and they packed their load and they moved to Canada. And um, yeah, they actually live with me now. So exactly. You know, so you're like the Joseph that was sent ahead here. of everybody else. <laughs> I guess, I guess so. You can say yeah, that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Now, it seems anyone looking at you now would say it's rosy, it's easy. No, you have your property, your family's all around you, you've been traveling, you know, you're, you're spending money to travel, but I'm sure it wasn't easy, you know. Like I was telling you during the week, sometimes people see all the good things at the end, they don't see the work you've put in. So let's let people know. Yeah. Let's pull back the curtains a bit. What are some of those challenges yeah. that you faced as an immigrant, particularly, you know, trying to get into the engineering and product management field and how, and yeah. as, of course, while there's challenges, there's also opportunities as well. So how did you balance those and, you know, make the best of both worlds? Um, I think for me, yes, th there was lots of challenges. I think one of the things is when I came here, 
I was a 18, 19 year old kid. I didn't have, I think I had one or two friends, but they were based in Manitoba. I came to Ontario myself. So I had to sort of figure out everything out myself. And there was, I, I really did not know a lot more Nigerians then. So I had to sort of mm. figure out how things work myself. So, but I think there was something that was resting on my shoulder. I think it's just me in general. I've got a very curious mind. I'm one of those people, yes, I consider myself a Christian, but I don't leave things to chance. If I don't know it, I would actually put in the time to know it. If I need to do research, if I need to ask questions, I would do that. I, I, I told myself I have to integrate with the Canadian society. And I went out, I was making friends. In class, I was making friends, but I also let my work show that I am, that I am capable. I remember one time in college where I've always been the guy that sits at the front of the class, which is weird because even in church, same thing. Big, massive church, I want to be the first guy on the, on the first seat. That's just who I am. No distractions. Because I think it's easy for me to look. Exactly. It's easy for me to lock eye with the professors and say, okay, sir, I have a question. Um, so I was that kid. I was always asking questions. But, you know, when we're taking calculus and everything, I was showing them that, you know what, I, I know a thing or two about calculus. I, you know, coming from a two-year of engineering school, you know, I was just breezing through calculus. So, yeah. you know, the professors noticed me saying, okay, you know, you're pretty good at your stuff. Like, did you study somewhere? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And um, so far, I think that helped me sort of start integrating well with the rest of the class. I think there were like two or three other black kids in the class, but eventually they all dropped out. And um, my program was one of the hardest. I think we started with about 40 or 60 students. And I think at the time when we graduated, it was only 15 of us left. That was how hard it is. Um, 25%. But I made sure I made friends. Yes, I made sure I made friends with the people in the class. I, I went to their parties. I went to their homes. I went to, to the bars with them. Just in that sense of integrating and understanding yeah. how things work here in, in Canada. So that's what worked for me, honestly. And then also I told myself, if Mohammed can do it, if Jane can do it, if Christine can do it, why not Kelly? Kelly can also do it as well. So I challenged myself and um, I'm a go-getter. Uh, I've always had this mentality from home. So combine that, I'm Nigerian, right, by blood. So there's always, I'm from the south side in Nigeria. I'm a worry boy. So worry not the Kaya last, right? <laughs> Where did so the Kaya last? The work. <laughs> at all, at all. So I had to put in the work, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now I, li I like what you've said. So because you've said this, it's very important. And I, I, I say this to people as well. You, you don't go all the way across the world to a new country and then you are keeping to only your people. You're just saying, Oh, I'm only going to do things with people that are like me, you know, because why didn't you, you might as well stay back in Nigeria, right? So how, despite the fact that you've been trying to integrate, you know, how has your Nigerian heritage? Because I know. I, we're very, we are like that. We are we're Nigerian like that. How has that Nigerian heritage yeah. influenced that approach, both in networking, in meeting people, and also in the professional space? You know, building up your career as you know who you are today. Mm -hmm. um, so, as Nigerians, you know, Nigerians are very social people, right? Yes. We like jaye jaye, oh, we like to party, <laughs> exactly. So, I think that essence of being social, I, I brought that along. And for a very long time, at least back when I was in Nigeria, like when I went to boarding school, I, I was this very timid, let me just keep to myself. And I remember so one time when my dad drove you. into school, <laughs> boarding school does that to you. Yes. And, and actually boarding school gives you this very self independence and sufficiency. Exactly. True. That I think for me, made me excel here in Canada by myself. But um, yeah, so I think that socialness of Nigerians, I think that helped me where I just want to know. And I would say this, when I moved to this country, I would say most of the doors that opened for me came from non-Nigerians, came from non-Africans. That's when I, that's when it clicked. I'm like, okay, I actually have to integrate with these people. And uh, I remember one time I took a summer job where we we're going door to door knocking and I, I was selling energy contracts. That job helped me, helped me with, with the way I spoke, helped me with the way I understood, okay, this is how a Canadian family functions. Because then people were chasing me. People would call the cops on me like, oh, there's this black kid at my door. But then some people would actually welcome me. In. Yeah, people would actually welcome yeah. me in and say, okay, come have dinner with us because I'm working till like, you know, 9 p.m. at night selling energy contracts. So that job helped me a lot. And after I left that job and I went back to school, I just continued that path of integrating, of communicating, of listening, seeing how to do things, uh, understanding the inside jokes, you know, with Canadians. I think that was a big part of it. So now I can sit with Canadians <laughs> and we're joking and we're laughing. They understand my joke. I understand your joke. And that's how, you know, it's helped me in terms of networking. I know... When it comes to networking in, in Canada, sometimes is network with people that 
want the best for you. Network with people that will inspire you. Network with people that are gatekeepers. Net network with industry leaders. Network with people that would mention your names in a room you have no access to. That's my strategy. So I think after I did that job, I just continued that same, you know, that, that same path. I said, okay, I am going to try to integrate with Canadians. And so far, it's helped me, not just in my personal life, but also in my professional and also my religious life as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like that you said that because I was I was at a I was at a panel last week. Um and I was talking to one of the well, I was talking to the audience and I, I made a comment and someone was like, Man, that was deep. I said, when it comes to networking, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Because the truth is, like you said, if someone is not gonna be able to speak for you in a room when you're there, then what's the point? You can't expect to get any favors there, right? So it has to be you have to right. make an impression that lasts such that even when you're not there. People are willing to speak for you. And I think that's one of the correct, one of the powerful things. I, I know it's not unique to Nigerians, but Nigerians have that in abundance. We know how to make a good impression. <laughs> you know, just ask all the girls from correct. Kenya and South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> they think Nigerian men are the best things since sliced bread, although Nigerian women may not agree with you, but <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, but, but, you, know. you well, give credit to some, <laughs> to the Nigerian ladies. I can tell you one thing for sure is, yeah, sometimes they drag us and whatever, but I can yeah. tell you, if they find other ladies talking nonsense about Nigerian uh, men, oh, yes. they turn uh, green. They come. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. I agree. I think you know it's, it's about yeah. knowing knowing the value of what you have, right? And I think that's a Nigerian Correct. thing. Right. Most most Nigerians, I've, I've had people say, oh, you Nigerian people, you're too proud. You like to make noise too much, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, <laughs> we know we know what we have. So if you don't flaunt it, if you don't blow your trumpet, who will blow it for you, right? No one's going to blow your trumpet for you if you don't Correct. blow it yourself. So I think that's part of the mm -hmm. thing that, um, that, that makes us who we are. And I know that a country and an environment like we have in in Canada actually helps us to thrive a lot, you know, because that's mm -hmm. why, you know, people like you and I can aspire to be who we are today. Because in Nigeria, it's like, Correct. who do you know? Or who is, is the other way around? Who do you know? Or where's your godfather? Or that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> so that is part of the challenges that I think is challenging the Nigerian industry compared to Canada. Fine, the Nigerian tech industry mm -hmm. is beginning to grow. We've got big players like, you know, the Paystacks and the uh, Flutterwave and all of those and the Interswitch doing great yep. things, you know. But how do you see, you know, the challenges? If you want to compare, compare, compare the challenges of, you know, what are the challenges we have in Canada and what can the Nigerian ecosystem learn from, you know, those things that we've done successfully here in Canada to improve the Nigerian ecosystem? Um, hmm, that's a quite interesting question. So, um, I think one of the things I would like to highlight is we need to understand the way an economy flourishes and it flourishes from products being created, products being exported. And I think one problem we have in Nigeria is all the way from the top to the bottom. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not one of those guys that say, oh, it's the government, the government. I think from the top to the bottom, uh, or from the bottom to the top, however you want to say it. So a country flourishes based on the product it creates, based on the number of jobs it creates, and based on what it exports out. That's how they're able to improve their way of life or the standard of living. So here in Canada, there's a lot of startups from Canadians, from non-Canadians, from Nigerians, Africans, whatever you want to call it. But these startups, these companies that are manufacturing products or putting out services, guess what? They're generating revenues that would go into yeah. taxes, that we would be used for building schools, hospitals, the roads, infrastructure, all of that, military. The fact is in Nigeria, we, first and foremost, we don't we have very ancient policies or policies that are <laughs> oh, up to so date to, to encourage this set of mentality. And also, I think the way teaching is done here in, in Canada is more like, yes, go out, work for an employer, but over time, also think of what you can create for yourself, what you can create and, and to solve a problem for the masses. In Nigeria, it's different. Value. That's not how our school, exactly, value. That's not how our schools are set up, right? Our schools are set up that you go, you come out, sometimes there's no job, people are just sitting idle, Respected. you understand? <laughs> and, and if you look at that environment, there's actually opportunity because when people sit idle for a while, I think the, 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 the smart and brave ones, that's when they actually come up with 
fantastic ideas. That's okay. You know what? We can do this. And then there are people like that, but I don't think we have enough policies or a culture like that in Nigeria where it's like, okay, if you can't find a job, create something. Is it, is it a service? Is it a product? So I think that is something Nigeria can learn from Canada. It's okay. How, how does a, an economy actually flourish? We need to create jobs. We need to create products for ourselves, right? And we need to change this mentality when it comes to, if you can't find anything, create something. I think that is something we can leverage in Nigeria to help us move on to the next, to the next level. Yeah, the project man the product manager and the project manager in you is speaking. I can hear that. And that would segue into my <laughs> next question. So what would you say is the re most real I don't know anything about product management. Fine. I'm I mean I mean cybersecurity. Yeah. If you ask me anything about firewalls and all of those things or identity, I'm happy, but product management, project management, project mm -hmm. mm, product, mm -mm, nothing. So what are the most some of the most rewarding aspects of your career as a product manager? You know, because people would say, What is product management? Okay, that, that that's a good question. The most rewarding part of my career. So so right now I, I work as a, a project manager, even though there, there's an element of product in there, but I think my title is a project manager. So I would say the the most interesting or most fulfilling part of it is you same thing goes for product as well, all right? So for a product, you have a vision, and now you need to see the vision all the way to the end. So and when I say the vision. You know, there's value that needs to be created to solve a problem. So the 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 benefit comes from, or should I say the fulfillment comes from, okay, does this vision solve this problem? And if it does, how does this solve the problem for people? And are these people happy? Is there satisfaction? That's that's for, with product. For project, on the other end, is okay, we have this project, we have a vision now. How do we take this from from start, from initiation, all the way to through execution all the way to completion and close out. So for me, where the fulfillment comes in or satisfaction comes in is when I see that a project has gone from start to finish, even with all the challenges and everything, or maybe someone left the team, whatnot, my budget gets reduced, whatever it is. But at the Decision. end, we're still able to finish the project and see a result and say, okay, you know what? We actually solved, like we actually finished this project for the customer and they are happy and they're satisfied. And I think the good part of it is while I was working for another company, while I was in that robotics and automation space, I worked heavily on um, EV, electric vehicle, battery and module, uh, battery pack and battery module assembly, uh, uh, automated assembly project. So um, I think a good example is one of those that went into the uh, the new uh, General Motors Hummer. So the, oh, okay, the new yeah. Hummer, the electric the Hummer. My, my actually, EV, yeah. I was actually one of the lead engineers. That yes, I was actually one of the lead engineers for that project. And it, it, it is heavy. So... I think for me, when I see a product I worked on drives past me, guess what? I feel this proud. Like, you know what? I did that. Or I'm part of the team that did that. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, so I think that's where this proudness and satisfaction comes in. Whether you're a product or a project, you know, with a project, yeah, you see this physical product, right? I think in the product, mostly in the software space, it's when you see the product was has actually shipped, people are actually leveraging the software tool or whatever. And then it's actually solving their problem and they're actually happy and satisfied. That's, you know, that, that comes with some level of proudness and satisfaction. Yes. I completely, I completely agree. Because I have the same feeling as well. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you have a problem, you know, some, there's an issue, an incident has been raised, you know, something is not working somewhere, they call it PT, mm -hmm. and you all dive in there. And then at the end of the day, you find this is what the problem is. You fix that and all the problems, all the bottlenecks just sort of wash away. There's nothing like that they feeling. Away. There's nothing yeah. like that feeling. <laughs> it's like it's like yeah. I did this, and I, I completely agree with you. you know, seeing you know seeing something, and for example, if it's like a product that is tangible, you know, seeing that drive past you on the road is like you know, and you're seeing not just you know that's the thing that you see all the big stars driving around, and you're like, okay, you know, I did that, and people are people like this. So I think that's a, that's a good that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, so yeah. knowing what you know today. If you could go back in time to say eight, nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago, what mm -hmm. advice would you give your younger self and say, you know what, for the future, this is what you should do? If you had a time machine. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh boy. I wish I had a time machine. Um, but unfortunately, I don't. I would say one of the advice I would give is maybe, maybe I could have started a bit earlier. Um, I think the I person I am advice. today is very different from the person I was 
a couple of years ago. Um, there was a time in my life where I, I knew how to read and everything, but I didn't want to read books. I didn't want to do this. I'm like, oh, it's too much work. You know, it's not, oh, it's too much networking, whatever. <laughs> but I had to get to a point in my life. I'm like, nah, I have to, if I, if I actually want to grow and succeed and actually hit some key milestones in my life, I need to educate myself outside my work, outside my school. Mm. And one, one thing, and one way of doing it is reading books. I read a lot of books. And sometimes I think I don't read a lot. Um, when I look at some of my peers, I'm like, oof, these guys are doing, you know, I had like 20 books a year. I'm like, I'm struggling to reach 12 a year, <laughs> but it's still something, right? But yeah. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, self-development and self-finance, uh, yeah. yeah. well-building books. So I would say I should have started earlier. I would say start earlier. Start reading those books earlier because there's a lot of stuff I know now. And if I knew 10 years ago, oof, I think I would be <laughs> maybe a couple of steps ahead of where I am right now. True, true. It's like it's like seeing a crystal ball into the future. You can't always you know, invest in Apple, <laughs> for example. Ah, uh, invest in Apple, yeah, yeah. Invest in Tesla. Ah, ah, exactly. Ah. You or know. invest in cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't like. I don't understand the crypto space. So I don't do a lot with crypto, but you know, I know people who are doing well who are cashing out. You know, that's good. That's good for them. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. tell us, tell the audience, not just us. You know, because. I know you fare a bit well, you know, we've got a few with your friends, but not many people listen to my name. So just tell us, say, two things that the audience would not guess about you. Apart from, of course, yes, you know you're Nigerian, you know. But two things the audience would not guess if they had to, you know, like, what, really? He does this? <laughs> okay, interesting. I think something just came to mind now that it's going to make you laugh as well. So, okay. Um, like I've always been on LinkedIn. I think I've been on LinkedIn over 10 years now. I actually just celebrated yeah. like 10 year anniversary on LinkedIn not too long ago. But prior to that, I've always had my LinkedIn. I use it once in a while. I reach out to people. But I think until like early this year, late last year, I decided, okay, I'm going to go serious on LinkedIn, right? I'm going to go ham on LinkedIn. But prior to that, um, I think when COVID happened, <laughs> <when> COVID happened <laughs> changed all our uh, lives. I was... Uh, <laughs> It changed our lives. I was a single guy. I was living by myself. You know, we were locked up. And guess what? I jumped on on TikTok. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I've always, you know, growing up in like, you know, Delta, there's all this, you know, when you look at Nigeria, you know the way Deltans, it's really worried people act. There's this comedic oh, yes. element about them. Yes. And I found that hey, I had that, those that in me. We hate it. And, <laughs> A Y like we've we, like the South Side has produced some of the best comedians like you know Basket Mouth A Y I go die I go save there's, there's so many <laughs> got on so you know I I started exhibiting some of my comedic side on TikTok so oh, uh, nice. I think I have about twenty thousand followers on TikTok and impressive. Um, impressive. people ask what do you do I'm like I just bring out my comedic side right because sometimes the fact is on LinkedIn. We are, sometimes we're too formal. Sometimes we're too strict. Like, oh, let me post professional stuff. I just, you know, stick to the script. But once in a while, if you look at my post, I do throw a bit of, you know, comedic element in there because that's who I am. Life isn't binary. It's not black or white. You can be whatever you want to be. So um, there's this element of me where I do have a comedic side. And in my job, in my personal life, in my pro professional life, I bring that out once in a while. Yes. Okay, so so are we going to see a stand-up show from Kelly in the future in 2024? You know, stand-up show <laughs> maybe with Egos, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm going to get into stand-up, but um, I think for me, and, it, and this is something else, I, I, I tell people I consider myself a generalist as opposed to a specialist. Yeah. And the reason why I say that is there's a book I read a while ago. It's called A Range why generalists succeed in a specialized world. So pretty much it's just making the argument that those people that are generalists, that dip their toes into different domains in life, they tend to have a more fulfilled life at the end of their lifespan. And they tend to yeah. solve problems in very unique ways compared to the specialist, right? The, yeah. oh, excuse me. Um, the, the surgeon, for example, right? He sees life in a very narrow myopic way where he's like, oh, surgery, uh, and these days, everybody wants to specialize, right? Oh, you're a surgeon. What do you do? The brain. What do you do? The neck, the eye, right? Specialist. And sometimes it's very myopic. But for those people that dip their toes in different spaces, the way they're able to solve problems, you will be shocked because they can yeah. pull experiences from these different spaces to solve this problem where everyone has been cracking their head like, oh, we can't solve it. Um, so yeah. I think my time on like Instagram and LinkedIn, uh, Instagram and TikTok, what I've led there, how to engage with people, how to put myself out there more, 
I've pretty much just taken that knowledge and I've moved it to LinkedIn. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. good. That's all I've done. <laughs> One other, one other thing I was going to ask you now. This is this is digressing a little bit, you know. So when you moved there, you said you had a lot of friends yeah. who were in mind too, but most of them. But you moved to Toronto. Why Toronto? And if you could do it again, would you still choose Toronto or would you choose somewhere else? Oh boy! Um, if I can afford it, I would actually live in Vancouver. I love Vancouver. I've been there a couple of times. My brother lives there actually. Thank you, thank you, thank and you. he lives in the Burnaby area. Um, nice. I love nice. the way it's it's clean, it's green. You've got views around. You're close to the beach. I love that. That's me. I'm a I, I, I'm an active guy, whether it's cycling, kayaking, uh, running, oh, walking. Nice. I'm that guy. So I think Vancouver is a perfect spot for me. And I love EVs. If you go to Vancouver, they're all over the place. They're like they're everywhere. The civics, all over the place. Um, but it's quite expensive. Yes. So, um, it is. So I think I may still come to Ontario. But first and foremost, let, let's correct it. I don't live in Toronto. Like, who does, right? Um, <laughs> you know what? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> who does? So I, I actually live... Um, I live about an hour outside Toronto. I live an hour west of Toronto. Um, I actually live in Kitchener Waterloo. I think you okay. must have heard of Kitchener Waterloo. That's how you um, miss riding, right? Pretty much, pretty much. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I, so I live in that area. Representing. Oh, he's doing a good job. Honestly, yeah. in a couple of years, I see him as like the mayor of Kitchener Waterloo. I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, nice. Let's just say that. Nice. I, and I nice. wish him all the best. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I came to Ontario. Uh, I came to Kitchener Waterloo, and that's where I've always been. I, I like it this way because while I was here living in Kitchener Waterloo, that's the only way I was able to save up to buy my property. That was the only way. If I lived in Toronto, I don't think I no would way. Be able to buy a property. So yeah. I lived here. I'm close to Toronto. I drive. So whenever my buddies are like, "Oh, let's go to Toronto," or there's something in Toronto, I'm there within an hour driving, yeah. right? And these days, the driving is like for me driving to Toronto is like driving half an hour because I, I I'm always in Toronto like every other weekend. That's how much exactly. I go to Toronto. You know. So, um, I think I'll still come to Toronto, honestly. I think, like I said, instead I go to Vancouver, I'll come to Toronto. I think there's lots of here. Uh, oh, I'll come to Ontario. There's lots of us, our people here. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. think um, I, di I, I did not grow up in, in Lagos. So, the busyness, the craziness, the noise people, not really a fan. But that's why I enjoy going to Toronto, make some noise, and then get out and come back. Get out space, leave the place. Keep quiet. <laughs> yes, nice. yes. I think Fantastic. Vancouver is a bit... Um, too too quiet for me like too quiet if you if you if i would say that it's a bit too i know calm. what you mean i love I it i know what you mean i know what you but mean. it's a bit too calm yeah but we, we we don't mind the calmness you know sometimes we just look out the window you see the mountains and you're like well i'm paying so much see for the rent mountains, or I like. houses, but i can't see the mountains <laughs> you can see the mountains you're paying for the views that's what you're paying for. exactly that's what it is you know it's the premium for the views Okay, so it's been a, it's been it's been very exciting talking to you today. I've had so much fun, but just you know, just as we're bringing it to a close, because I know many of the people who are actually following this podcast or watching our videos are yeah. they're new to the country or trying to change their careers or you know just sort of thinking how am I going to make it in this Canadian dream? Even people who were born here as well. So, two pieces of advice: mm -hmm. if someone said to you, you know, okay, Kelly, this is this is where I am today. I don't know what to do and I want to become successful. I want to make it. Can you give me two things that you think I should do that will make me successful? What would they be? Um, well, two things. I think I have more, but I'll just highlight two things. One of the first thing is, uh, or maybe I'll, I'll say one last thing at the end. First and foremost, practice the habit of continuous improvement. So when I talk about continuous improvement, if you want to make it from the business side of things or your professional side of things, Practice the act of continuous improvement. When I say continuous improvement, learning. You must learn. Whether in school, outside school, read books, take certifications, take classes, boot camps. Always continue adding value to yourself. Because the more value you, you add to yourself, the more value people see, and the more they want to, to pay you for that value, if you know yeah. what I mean. Um, so I think practice the act of continuous improvement. I see people, because I do a lot of you know career coaching and mentorship, and I see a lot of resumes, I see a lot of LinkedIn. And these are people that are out of, you know, out of college. They have like, you know, seven, 10 years experience, no certification, no class, no nothing whatsoever. I'm like, no, as an employer, I'm not going to hire you. You know why? Because I'm going to hire you. You're just going to come. You're going to become a, a furniture, like a dinosaur. Yeah. That's it. You're, you're, the you're not showing you want to grow and learn. Yeah, exactly. So I, I say practice the act of continuous improvement. Um, read books. Right, right. And then the next one I would say is, 
take a bet on yourself, right? Take a bet on yourself. Mm-hmm. I want to say take a bet on yourself. Know your stuff. Put it out there. Um, be confident. Um, network, right? Because I, I think if you take a bet on yourself, it will be easy for you to network. It will be easy for you to put yourself out there. Believe in yourself. When I, when I say take a bet on yourself, believe in what you know. I tell you this to people a lot of times. You are more skilled and talented than you, than you know. Yeah. So take a bet on yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes take some calculated risk. Sometimes people are so comfortable, they don't want change. Take a bet on yourself. Know that you would succeed and just go for it. Just gun it. Exactly. I completely, and totally. maybe the last one here, don't sleep on LinkedIn. I'm sorry. <laughs> LinkedIn is bigger than one. I was waiting it. for that. Don't sleep on LinkedIn. Because <laughs> LinkedIn has that. helped me in my career. Don't sleep on LinkedIn. I completely and totally agree. So anyway, I've been saying this all the time. And then now you're hearing someone else say, you know, you know, focus, challenge yourself, get out of your comfort zone and, you know, make LinkedIn your next best friend. So um, that was great. It was great talking to you today. I had so much fun doing this. I think we should do this again sometime. You know, talk about some other stuff. Uh, Maybe we'll talk about non-work related stuff, you know, fun stuff that can be, you know, like all your travels and your trips. Come on, tell us, you know, where should we go to next? Um, but this has been another episode of the CyberSec Migrant. We've been speaking with Kelly. It's been great having him here today. I'm going to put a link to his LinkedIn down in the description below as well. So if you are interested in connecting, and I'm sure he's open to connecting, please feel free to reach out to Kelly on LinkedIn. And he's going to be able to, you know, you can share from his expertise. He puts out fantastic content on LinkedIn all the time. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, uh, give it a like and subscribe to our channel as well so you can get more information, more new videos like this when we put them out. And until next time, I want to say thank you to Kelly for joining us here. And this has been the CyberSec Migrant. My name is Femi. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the CyberSec Migrant Podcast. We hope you found today's insights valuable and inspiring. If you enjoyed today's conversation, make sure to check out our other episodes for more in-depth interviews, stories, and discussions with cybersecurity experts and thought leaders. Remember, the world of cybersecurity is ever-revolving, and we're here to guide you through it. Whether you're just starting your journey or are a seasoned professional, there's always something new to discover. And one more ask, don't keep this knowledge to yourself. Share the CyberSec by God podcast and our YouTube channel with your friends, colleagues, and anyone who's passionate about cybersecurity. And let's build a community that thrives on knowledge and collaboration. Thank you for being a part of our growing audience and your support means the world to us. Feel free to reach out to us with your feedback, questions, and comments, either on our Twitter handle, at CybersecMigrant, or on Instagram, at CybersecMigrant. Keep learning, keep growing, and until next time, This is Femi signing off. Stay secure.